crime. A better problem with a smaller cost and more of it at the very time when we heard talks of food being too high. So the reporter asked me earlier today why it's higher today than it was 10 years ago. The same answer applies compared to what? You know, we had some interesting sessions in Congress last year. I remember I testified, I had the chance to testify before the Judiciary Committee that held some hearings on food problems. The committee happened to be headed up by Mr. Rodino. You've heard of that committee. They had a TV show running for a period of time. <laughs> after this, they went after bigger game, but that particular week it was on farm and food prices. And I had a witness, and one of the congressmen asked, Mr. Litton, why is food high? I said, because there's a shortage of it. Well, he said, why is there a shortage? And I said, because the price and profit motive isn't there. I said, you give the farmers of America a reason to act a reasonable price and a reason to profit, and they'll produce more food than America can eat or store. They always have. Well, he said, Mr. Litton, it can't be that simple. He got elected to Congress, you know. I said, it just happens to be that simple. All the farmers of this country have is just a chance to assume the price and profit might be there, and you won't believe how much they can produce. Another congressman leaned over and said, Mr. Litton, when are we going to see dollar a pound steaks again? Well, I said, 20 years ago, congressman got paid $12,500 a year. That got raised to 20000 and to 30000 now to 42500 It's rumored to go to over $50,000 a year in another year or two. I said, I said, we'll see dollar a pound stakes again when we see $12,500 a year congressman again. <laughs> you know, that was something we understood. And he leaned back and he smiled from ear to ear almost as if to say, well, now, why didn't somebody say that before? <laughs> That's my bad side over there. Would you please? That... <laughs> well, we had an interesting session. We really did. And I think these are the kind of questions that we need to be asking somebody. Dick mentioned earlier when he introduced me about the prospects of the weight of a pound of bread. Dick, uh, you remember, what was it, a year ago, they said that a pound loaf might go to a dollar? And I thought about the famed Russian deal. Of course, you people here are the great, great wheat producers of the world and, and have done such an extraordinary job at it. And I think back of the Russian wheat deal. There are an awful lot of people who assume that that was the cause of all of our problems, failing to recognize that Russia was going to buy it somewhere. It didn't mind, matter where they bought it from us. They were going to get it from someone. It would have had the same effect eventually. But more that it conveyed to an awful lot of people that the price of wheat and the price of commodities is the big factor in the price of the retail product. So during that escapade, I went into the Library of Congress and I did some research. And I found to my surprise that for 25 years in this country, from 1947 to 1971, we saw the price of bread, pound loaf, one full pound, go up from 13 and a half cents to 25.8 cents. During that five years in this country, when the price of a pound loaf of bread nearly doubled, we saw the value of the wheat in the bread go from 2.7 cents to 2.6 cents. These are the kind of figures that need to be presented to the American people. Compared to what? Serious questions. So you know there's just not that much food in food nowadays. <laughs> I did a bit of research into some other areas, and I found, for example, in, will you take a can of spinach? My son would say, Dad, you take it. I don't want it. <laughs> 25 cents is what a can of spinach sold for in 1973, a 303 can of spinach, 25 cents. It went up in one year to 26 and a half cents. How much do you think we could have reduced the price of that can of spinach if the farmer who made the product made no profit? One mill. The paper can cost more than that. And take other products, if you will. Take a, take a box of cornflakes. 38-cent box of corn. 
How much could we reduce the price of that box of cornflakes if the farmer not only gave up his profit, but gave up his product as well, contributed profit and all of the corn, what would we be able to do to that box of cornflakes? We reduce it, 38 cent box, by 2.8 cents. The box costs more than that. The trinket in the box costs more than that. <laughs> and nobody was boycotting trinkets last year. <laughs> I think these are questions in the past. We talked about inflation. I understand the president made a speech on that today in Kansas. What is inflation? Inflation, we're told, is a situation where there's too much money out there in, re in this economy of ours, which makes it worth less. I think a better definition is to say that inflation is a situation whereas we have a shortage of goods in relation to the dollars that are there. Same definition. But when you look at my you recognize that one of the ways of overcoming inflation is to increase productivity, to produce more goods so that more of them are there. I mention this definition because I think it would be a good one to share with America, who many of which think the farmer and food prices are chiefly responsible for inflation today, just as a reporter thought food was too high. America, that a way to solve the problem of inflation is to be more productive. And then also tell America that the productivity per man hour of the American farmer for the last 20 years has more than doubled that of the non-farmer. And if the non-farmer had increased their productivity in the last 20 years as much as the farmer, there would be no inflation in America today, period. <laughs> and that happens to be an economic fact that we haven't Reserve in America. Now we talk about balance of trade. I very much realize how important export is to this state here and how much of your product you move abroad and how dependent upon you this export market, this economy here is. And I'm sure it must make you sad to realize, as I'm sure you do, that in the halls of Congress right now pending in the box that we deposit our bills are some 40 bills that would ban the export of farm commodities under various circumstances and conditions. Even more depressing are the prestigious names of the members of Congress that are attached to those bills. Ladies and gentlemen, in 72 and 1973, this great productive America of ours bought more goods than it sold for the first time since 1893. We bought $2 billion more in goods in 72 than we sold, and in 63, the deficit was $6 billion. Last year, in the, in the black, just by $1.5 billion. We're going to be deeply in the red again this year. We can't continue to buy more than we sell any, any longer than you can continue to take more out of your bank account than you put in. Because trade is just that. Trade ball bearings for televisions. Somebody goes back somewhere and puts a little more gold out of one pile and puts it into the other. But basically, it's a trade. And you can't continue to buy more than you sell as a nation. You want to continue to devalue your dollar to the extent that we have time and again and devalue everything in this country. What are we going to do to reverse that balance of trade? Are we going to export labor? No, it's higher in this country than others. Are we going to export manufactured goods? No, in 73, when we had a deficit of $6 billion, we had a deficit of $10 billion in manufactured goods. What do we produce in this country? Cheap enough to be competitive on the world market. Food. We increased our farm exports last year when we were barely in the black by $1.5 billion, from $9 billion to $18 billion. And that's why we were in the black last year. Look how much we would have been in the red last year and not have exported the farm commodities to the extent that we did. Interesting. The very year when Americans were saying food is too high, it was the one thing that we produced cheap enough to be competitive on the world market that kept this country of ours in the black and just barely. One further comment about exports of farm commodities. Strangely enough, the same people who are saying that we should build a wall around America and keep our farm commodities here are the same people who are saying food in America is too high. Now let's be consistent wrong, at least be consistently wrong. 
because when food is too high, or anything is too high, you don't need to build a wall around the country to keep it in. It's too high, remember? It's too high. You only build a wall around your country to keep a product in if it's cheap. If it's so cheap that the other people of the world and less affluent nations such as ours are willing apparently to pay more for it than the American people are willing to pay for the product produced in American farmers. Be consistent. Let's realize that farm commodities represent that one opportunity we have as a nation to be productive to keep this country back. And while we're doing that, let's share with America the profit picture of the farmers. And Ray Schweitzer touched on that this morning. How do you tell Americans that the farmers are not ripping the consumer off? How do you tell Americans that the farmers don't indeed spend their winters in the Caribbean, as someone suggested earlier. Well, I found an easy way to do it. After two years in Congress of trying, I found an easy way to do it. I just took the net profit of the American farmer for the last four years, available from the Department of Labor. Then I averaged it and divided it by 212 million Americans. Then I divided that by 365 days. In essence, I was seeing what would happen if we distributed the profits of all the farmers of America, 212 million Americans. But to put it another way, that answer tells us how much the American people would have saved for the last four years if all the food that they bought by American farmers had been produced by farmers who made no profit for four years, who made no return on their investment for four years who made no return on their labor for four years, no profit at all, and still were as productive as they were. Do you know how much Americans would have saved for the last four years in their food purchases? Eight cents per person per day. Now those who suggest going down the price of food to the consumer by squeezing the profit of the farmer, I point out to them that if they squeezed it all out, every bit of it, right down to the last penny, and still got farmers to be productive, all they're going to save is eight cents per person per day. That's a small price to pay for the finest and most productive agriculture industry in the world. If you take a look at all of the other prices, you'll find, for example, for the last year, the average household of 3.2 persons, I've never met a household of 3.2 persons, <laughs> but did, and it were average, they would be paying $164 more this year than they paid last year for food, 164 Now, how much of that $164 increase do you suppose occurred between the time he left the farmer and it reached the consumer? Would you believe $152 of it? Last year, the cost of production for the farmer has gone up 16%. The prices he got paid for his product went down four, and the price of retail food level to the consumer went up 15 percent. Now, while we're looking for a culprit to make a comment, one thing I've noticed in our industry, as divided as we are, is how we have consistently fought among ourselves over years and done it with such fury and success. Just think for a minute. The price of food, beef, pork, corn, what have you, goes up. It goes up at the retail level. And what happens? Well, the purebred man, he points his finger at the commercial man, the commercial man points his finger at the feeder, the feeder, the wholesaler, the retailer, the retailer, the back and forth, we point at each other and say, they're the cause of the price going up. The consumer stands back and looks at all of this and says, huh, I must be getting ripped off. General Motors raises the price of their cars $500 because they say it costs more to produce it. We found out different now. But they said it costs $500 more to produce it. The executives of General Motors didn't stand around pointing their fingers at the workers, the workers at aluminum, aluminum steel, wire, wire at somebody else, and somebody else at trucking. Nobody pointed their finger at anybody. They simply said it cost $500 more to make a product. Three days later, we quit talking about it. Sixty days later, the cattlemen were still around pointing their finger about that three cents increase. I'm not sure anybody's ripping off anybody. And the percentage of our income that we spend for food continues to go down year after year. The quality of the product that we have to sell continues to go up. I'm not sure anybody ripping off anybody. And I'm not sure we have any excuses to make whatsoever. Neither am I sure that pointing our fingers at each other 
helps the situation at all. We talked about the price of food going up last year. One of the disturbing things is agriculture never got together and told the consumer why. We were too busy pointing our fingers at each other. Let me look at some of the reasons food went up. I won't go into detail. You people here understand it well. Starting in the fall of 1972, we increased Social Security $10.2 billion a year. The inflationary spiral that we have, that's something we're going to have to continue to do because you can't earn tomorrow's dollar on today's market. The people that got that $10.5 billion or $10.2 billion out of a $250 billion budget spent it on food. They didn't buy it on a, spend it on a bigger car or take a trip to the Riviera. And then we had increase of wages at the lower pay scale. Substantially in the latter part of 72 and early 73. When you're making $1.60 an hour and you're raised to $2, a lot of the 40 cents goes for food. When you're making $10 and it's raised to $10.40, you're already eating all the beans you want. Raise wages at the lower scale and you'll see demand for food go up and it did. Russia and China had a bad crop year. We had two bad years out of three that decreased the supply. Russia and China changed their food policy with their people, their trade policy with us and increased the price. We divided a dollar twice in 14 months. We made it a better buy abroad and they bought more of it and it increased the demand. We had a change in the sex life of the anchovy off the coast of Peru. We had a great effect by food and the price producing it. These are some of the reasons. Food stamps. Food stamps. In 1969, we spent $250 million a year on them. $250 million in 1969. Do you know what we spent in this fiscal year? $4 billion. And all of that increased demand. Ladies and gentlemen, when you decrease the supply and you increase the demand, you're going to find an accompanying increase in price. And that's what happened. No country on the part of agriculture, just pure, simple economics. And we didn't get together to explain it to the consumer. It's about the 90-year-old farmer that was singing about a 21-year-old girl, and they told the old farmer that it might be fatal. And the old man said, well, she goes, she goes. <laughs> Food price has been going up and we haven't taken the time to explain them why. I've talked to a lot of consumer groups around the country. And every time that I talk to a consumer, the one question they always ask is, why does it go up so fast? Why does a can of peaches cost 32 cents a day and 42 cents a day? Agriculture ought to get together and just to convey to the American consumer that food prices and farm prices always go up and down fast because of the law of economics, because of the inelastic demand for food. I understand the economic students that are here in this room tonight, and they well understand inelastic demand as an economic impact of life. In the case of most products, in the case of most products, we have a little less product available, so the price goes up a little bit. Now that it's gone up a little bit, some people back off from buying it. We have a little less demand, we have a little less of a product, the price hasn't gone up very much. I force the people off the market and everybody's happy. But in the case of food, when we have a little less available, we have a heck of a time of talking people out of eating. They're, they're very contrary about that. They, they just insist on eating. So we have the same amount of demand out there for a smaller amount of product, a 1% decrease in food supply, and we'll have normally a 4 to a 5% decrease in food at the retail level. 5% decrease in food supply, and you'll have a 20 to a 25% increase at the retail level. Fact of life. Works the other way, too. If we reduce sirloin steaks to four cents a piece, you wouldn't eat 60 for lunch. You can only eat so much. Consequently, a little bit too much of a product on the market, and the price is going to drop substantially. And the farmers in this room have seen that economic law work very well. I talked to a group the other day, and I said, Mr. Litton, why do we have to talk to the consumer groups now that you talk about? And I said, well, you know, a good many years ago, they told of the little boy that was born that never talked. They tried everything they could to get him to talk, and he never spoke. Finally, they gave up, and one morning, that eight-year-old boy was served Wheaties instead of his traditional corn cakes for breakfast. And that young fellow used the kind of language that only a Washington farmer would use on a hot Saturday afternoon when his bloated bull stepped on his foot and his finest cow came back in heat and his best heifer aborted. <laughs> Did I lose you on that? You know. <laughs> See, we started out with the cow, and then...
You know, they all gathered around the young boy and they asked him why he never talked up till now. Well, he said, up until now, everything's been all right. <laughs> up until now, everything's been all right with the consumer. Someone asked me a year and a half ago, they said, Mr. Litton, why did we run out of gas all of a sudden? Well, I said, when you got on the gasoline in your car every morning, you drive it all morning, all afternoon, into the night, into the hours of the morning, when you run out, you're going to run out all of a sudden. <laughs> That's what's happened to agriculture. We've had people leaving the country for the city for 20 years. This rural urban migration had been taking place for a long time. We didn't know it until all of a sudden the consumers who up till now, everything had been all right, became unhappy. And then all of a sudden, we woke up and found that we were living in a very urban society. And that we need to communicate with them and talk with them. <coughs> you know, we have young people getting married in Boston and Buffalo today, Chicago and Newark and San Diego today. They represent a new generation. And it's poor. It's urban. And over half of the income of the average consumer said, what you ought to be doing is voting for the farmer almost every time you can. Anything you can do to help the farmer, even if you had to subsidize him, if you had to. Anything you can do to see that that farmer is more productive and more sound so he can be more productive and produce more food, meaning the price would be lower for your constituents. She sat back and she said, you know, I'd never thought of that before. I'd never thought of that before. And she and other congressmen traditionally representing poor urban business have always voted against farm programs, not realizing how much damage they were doing to their constituents, not realizing that half of the income of their constituents went to buy food. She told me something else. She told me, she said, you know, one of the reasons that I'm voting against a farmer is because farm congressmen have been voting against New York City. She's right. She's as right as she can be. For too long, farming areas have been re-electing congressmen on the simple basis that they go back to their district and brag about how many times they voted against the cities, and that helps us a bunch. That helps us a bunch. And for too many years, urban congressmen have been getting re-elected because they vote for the, against the farmer, raising the price of the product to their constituents. And that doesn't help either. Shirley Chisholm went on television once and told the people that after she and I had talked about agriculture, she's been voting for the farmer most of the time, and she has. And I convey this to you simply to say that these are people we can reach out to. We need to just stand back and say they're, the enemy. they're not the enemy, they're the customer. They're the customer. And we've had politicians pitting the producer and the consumers against each other for too long. <coughs> Tom Foley today announced plans to take a look at the food stamp program, and it needs to be looked at. There are some abuses. I'm going to say something now. And I know a lot of the farmers in this room are going to misunderstand, perhaps, what I'm going to say. Many won't agree with what I'm going to say, but I, I'm kind of like Harry Truman. I like to say what I think. And then next week I won't have to have so much trouble recalling what I said this week in Spokane. <laughs> farmers traditionally have voted against the program for the poor. And I think I've made it very clear that I'm a conservative when it comes to welfare. I don't think that anybody ought to get a handout as long as they're able to work and there's a job for them. I think we ought to help anybody not help themselves. That applies to the people of this country as well as others and other countries. But keep in mind, that when you put a dollar in the pocket of the poor, 50 cents of it's going to be used to buy the product you produce. You put a dollar in the pocket of the millionaire, he's buying all the food he wants. Think about it. Think real hard. What helps a consumer helps a producer. Put jingle in their jeans, let them have the money they need to buy the product you produce, and they'll buy more of it. That's a way to create demand for your product. And let me say something else. When you have programs in Congress that permit the farmers of this country to have more credit at a better rate, when you permit the farmers of this country to have more money to buy better memory and better seed and better stock to expand their production to produce more food, there's going to be more of a 
better at a lower price and a better quality to the consumer. And that's something we need to tell urban congressmen too. What helps one helps the other. And it's about time we started to convey this story to each other. I had Eleanor Guggenheimer, the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs of New York City, out to Missouri last year. Do you know how many people, the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, the gal that replaced Betty Furness and Bess Meyerson, do you know how many she employs in her office in New York City? 460. 460. Plus 60 volunteers in the main office and 30 in the regional ones. That's more people than all of our national farm organizations employ combined on the national level. She tells New Yorkers what to buy and what not to buy and when to buy it. Until I took her out to the farms of Missouri last year, she'd never in her life seen a hog or a feedlot. And we walked into the farm family feedlots, and we, the wind was in the right direction that day, too. <laughs> we went to church with the farm family, and we sat down and had breakfast with 4-Hers and FFA youngsters, and them convey to her how they were going to have to leave the country for the city because there wasn't enough money there for them and their parents. We had lunch with farm families. We visited one farm family at milking time and watched the five boys, ages seven through 17, with their Levi's and no shirts, help their dad. And I watched as Mrs. Guggenheimer was surprised. Here, the seven-year-old boy said, yes, ma'am, we have to milk cows on holidays and Sunday. 10-year-old said, ma'am, these cows have calves, have to be fed and milked and come in heat seven times a day. We had a real dialogue for a while. And she went back to New York City. She's had two dinners in my honor and brought in consumer leaders for me to talk to in New York. I had one three weeks ago. <coughs> Bess Meyerson was there, Betty Furness was there, the editor of Ladies Home Journal was there, Robert Redford's wife of Consumer Action Group was there, the editor of New York Times was there. We dialogued. When Mrs. Guggenheimer introduced me, she pointed out how important it was for the farmers to have enough stability, economically speaking, to have enough income and be enough, well off enough to expand their production. And then and only then, she said, will the consumers of New York have a good quality product at a good price. And I leaned back against the wall before I spoke and I smiled a little bit and I said to myself, you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> But I've learned something too, and I'm sure she's just as proud of the conversion she's made on me as I am of the conversion I made on her. I mentioned food stamps and what Tom intends to do in his study of them. Let me touch on it a, a brief second, and again, you like what I say. Those who traditionally oppose the food stamp program are farm groups and their representatives. Think about it. What is the program? What would you say if I were to go back to Congress next week and propose a $4 billion a year expenditure for an air conditioner stamp program? We're going to spend $4 billion a year and people are going to get those stamps and redeem them for air conditioners. Do you know what? The air conditioner industry would have a celebration next week. That's what we have in America. $4 billion our government puts up to encourage people to match it their funds to the product you people produce. So the next time you decide that the food stamp program is wrong, stop and think who it helps the most once it's the poor. It creates an unusual strong demand for the product you buy, and it's demand that raises a price for your product. This is a kind of understanding that I mentioned. I'll close with one thing because Dick over here is looking at what. Don't mind when he looks at it, it's when he shakes it that I start to. <laughs> you know, when I was in the FFA, and those were some of my great years as, as a youth, I traveled around with Paul Gray, who's sitting here as an advisor for the FFA, and I took the trip that these young boys are taking now as we went around the country. And one of the things that I was noticing then was how many young people were leaving the country for the, for the city, how many were going from the rural areas of Washington to the big bright lights of Chicago and New York. And I was thinking how all of this has changed now in about 17, 18 years, Paul. Today, we're not seeing that people leave the country for the cities for the bright 
lights because those bright lights have been dimmed with the smog and the fog and the soot and the dirt and the film and the crime and the congestion and the crowded conditions of asphalt-laden crime in metropolitan America. Sixteen, seventeen years ago, the average American did indeed want to live in the city. Today, they have a hope of having a home in the country. If you don't believe it, drive into Spokane some Friday night and finding out where the traffic's going. Are they coming in for the weekend or going out for the weekend? They have their choice, you know. Are they building their homes at the edge of Spokane or inner city Spokane? They've got their choice, you know. Take a look at the TV commercials, the radio ads, the ads in magazines today. Designed by people that will spend $50,000 to find out if your wife will buy more soap in a blue box than a red one. How do they sell their product today? Well, you'll find out, for example, that cigarettes taste better, smoke better, draw better, with more flavor and more taste if you smoke them in the country. Under a tree, after it's just rain, on the back of a horse, herding cattle. <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing they spend that much money to sell cigarettes to people who smoke and ride horseback. <laughs> They're spending that kind of money to people who smoke who would like to ride horseback. They didn't, they take that cigarette and poke it in the mouth of a movie star and take their picture downtown Times Square and slap it on the back of Newsweek each week like they used to. I saw an ad in a magazine the other day, four pages. Here was a cowboy out in the middle of 300 cows. Did you see, see the commercial? Did you read the cap underneath it? It said, come to where the flavor is. <laughs> Now, that was written by somebody who didn't know much about the cattle, but... <laughs> Maybe the USDA did that thing, you reckon? <laughs> or Mr. George Soltz, who thought that a freeze would be effective for the cattle industry. Maybe he designed it. I remember Schultz went on TV in the Today Show to defend the freeze on food prices. And Mr. Schultz said, farmers never had it so good. Uh, he thought up that line before somebody else did. Then he went on to say, the farmers are crying all the way to the bank. Schultz, the Secretary of the Treasury, heck, if he knew about farming, he knew why they were crying and why they were going to the bank. <laughs> you know, I picked up a magazine the other day, and I saw a four-page spread, beautiful color pictures of a mattress with a cow pasture. And I'm sure that the consumer that bought that mattress thought she just bought 40 acres of pasture in North Washington. <laughs> of course, I took the magazine and burned it before our cows saw it, you know. I, I'm not going to take any chances. The bulls are already laying down the job. <laughs> Just laying there reminiscing about the good old days of AI. You know. <laughs> CAI is when you... <laughs> well, I better not need a loan for him. I've already blown it, I'll tell you. But really, if you stop and think of the commercials that I'm talking about, almost every product that's wrapped in packaged and sold to the consumer somehow is wrapped in blue sky, green grass, white open spaces, fresh water, and the rural life that the farmer lives. The image of the farmer is much different today. A little old farm boy from Washington went to New York City, and he met a banker, a banker by the name of James A. Cobb. This Washington boy was named Fred Hicks. He'd been out here in the good country and Mr. Cobb asked the boy where he's from. He said, Washington. He said, you're a farm boy. He said, that's right. Mr. Cobb said, your name again. The son, the boy said, Fred Hicks. And he laughed so loud, you could hear him all the way down to the hall. The banker said, son, do you know what we do with Hicks in New York City? The boy said, no, sir, but I know what we do with Cobbs back in Washington. <laughs> you know, you tell that story in Washington, you got to explain it to them, you know. <laughs> It's been a long time since the farm boys have been called a hick, though, I'll tell you that, or a hayseed. I went to the University of Missouri College of Agriculture a good many years ago. I'm a good-looking gal, asked me where I lived. I always said just outside of Kansas City, about 95 miles just outside of Kansas City. <laughs> but these farm boys we had on the program today don't make any excuses for living on the farm or being, being the sons and daughters, I'll tell you, of farm people. That image has changed substantially. I know, I'll tell you, I born raised on a very small farm in Lock Springs. I, anybody here ever been to Lock Springs? Gee, you people don't get around much. Oh, a couple of you do. And not a very big town, population 84. 
We uh, never could grow that town. You know, every time a baby is born, a man would leave town. We just never. <laughs> We, we had on our farm, those of you that have traveled a lot and seen it, and we had no plumbing and we had uh, no telephones. Finally, we got two longs and a short. We had no refrigerator. We had a box built on the window in the wintertime. No maintenance problems. Sometimes we